week. I think the last person is Namatai. So we're hoping that she will be able to join us in the conversation soon. Uh, I think my co-host Jeffrey Smith will just follow up with her just to make sure she's not having any technical challenges. And then we will be able to just um, have her on board. But I think even before she joins, we can still just run through the basic housekeeping um, so that you are aware of how the space is going to run and just some of the things I would love for you to do so that you make this as informative, as interactive as possible. So the first thing, obviously, is we would love for you to share the space in your timeline. So if you could just share the link to the space so that the people that do not already be aware of the space can actually see that it's already happening and potentially join us. And also just to remind you that you can be tweeting about this this conversation or any of the reflections that you have in line with the topic or some of the things that are going to be talked about. And remember to just use the hashtag Resist Bureau Live so that we can just follow up with the conversation or you can just tag the Resist Bureau account and then we'll be able to just track the conversation. And then also because we'd love for the audience to also feed into the conversation, one of the things that we're going to allow you to do is after the speakers that we have today give their insights, we'll be able to take some questions and reflections from the audience. So I'd advise you to stick around to the end so that you're able to feed in. If you think you're going to forget your question, we also recommend that you use the comment section to just share your thoughts, your questions and things like that so that we can keep the conversation going even before um, the speakers finish giving their insights. So yeah, just to kind of just kick it off, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today in this Twitter space. Um, I think as a young Zimbabwean, I'm very excited about this conversation. I've been very excited about the election. So just seeing the number of people that already jumped into the conversation shows just how many people have an interest in not just the election itself, but what's happening in Zimbabwe for all of us. Um, so I would want to also just give context to where we are, I guess, as a country, and also the context within which we're setting this conversation today. So we are hosting elections as a country here in Zimbabwe on Wednesday, August 23. We were basically electing the president representatives for parliament and local authorities. The incumbent president, Emerson Nangagwa, is seeking re-election against a number of challenges, including Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the Citizens Coalition for Change, CCC. The elections are taking place against a backdrop of economic crisis, political uncertainty. Zimbabwe's economy has been in decline for a number of years, and the country is facing high levels of inflation, unemployment, and there have also been incidents of violence, and there's also just a fear of violence. On 4 August, for instance, Tinyashe Chitsunge, a supporter of Zimbabwe's main opposition party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, was stoned to death. He was traveling to a CCC rally when the group that he was with was ambushed by suspected PF supporters. The incident was not in itself an isolated one and explains why the proportion of Zimbabwe's population fearing violence during the election has risen to 58% from 43% in 2018, according to the Afrobarometer survey. A raft of highly repressive legislation, including the private voluntary organization PBO Bill and the Patriotic Bill, have raised concerns over this month's elections being too similar to the environment within which those held under former President Robert Mugabe way. Today, we have, we have civil society groups that are hampered by major restrictions on their activities and the lack of confidence in the ability of an increasingly politicized judiciary to protect them. International observers are also constrained by late arrivals into the country and the fact that the government has been vetting who is and is not allowed to be part of international missions. For their part, international donors appear to be stuck in a rut, unsure of how to engage with the government of Emerson Nangaga. With this continued closure of what he had initially promised to be open, free, fair and credible elections. So in this Twitter space, we are convening civil society leaders, activists, leading writers to assess the electoral environment and what can be done, if anything to safeguard the polls. We'll also look at lessons from Zimbabwe's history and other countries within the region that have managed to resist oppressive electoral environments to hold those in power accountable. As it is a Twitter space, remember that we're looking for your contributions. We'll also take questions like I've already said and comments once our speakers have shared their insights. Remember to share the space. I'll emphasize this so that there was more people that have access to it. We're also recording it, so it'll still be accessible for those that don't manage to join the live. So co-hosting with me today is my colleague, Jeffrey Smith. Hey, Jeff, how are you feeling today? Could you remind everyone what the Resistance Bureau is and maybe introduce our speakers? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mentade, for that excellent overview. It does look like we have all of our speakers on. Namate, I see that you have joined us. I have also sent you an invitation to be speaker, so hopefully you see that. Thanks to everyone for, for being here on time and, and for the interest in this really timely Twitter space. Um, so as a way of refreshing everyone's memory, the Resistance Bureau exists to focus on the major threats to human rights and freedom in Africa, but also worldwide, while shining a light on the enduring struggles for freedom. Today's Twitter space will feature journalists, activists, and researchers who are well known for campaigning for fundamental freedoms and democracy in Zimbabwe. First, we have with us Hope El Chungono, an award-winning journalist who has exposed multiple corruption scandals within the Zimbabwean government, currently led by President Emerson Managagwa, who came to power by means of a military coup in November 2017. Hopal has been arrested and jailed multiple times due to his crusading work, yet he remains an outspoken advocate for truth and for accountability. Next up, we have Namate Kokweza, a human rights and youth activist who is the founder and current executive director of We Lead Trust, an organization she started at age 18, which focuses on youth leadership, development, and advocacy. She has been the recipient of numerous awards for her work, including the inaugural Kofi Annan Next Gen Prize for Democracy. We are also really lucky to be joined once again today by Zinzele Ndebele, a citizen journalist and one of the most respected civic voices in Zimbabwe today. Among his many affiliations, he is a leading member of the Matibili Land Forum, a network of nonprofit groups and churches that focuses on the region's Gukurhundi atrocities and issues related to national healing. Rounding out our featured speakers today is Rose Hanzi, a human rights lawyer and the director of Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights. She is an expert in human rights law and transitional justice and has served on a number of important boards, including as a past thematic leader of the National Transitional Justice Working Group in Zimbabwe and currently on the Coalition for an Effective African Court. We're also delighted to have Larry Garber with us today as today's discussant. He'll be joining us a bit later on. As many of you might know, Larry is a former senior official at the U.S. Agency for International Development and is an international election expert with literally decades of experience working in Zimbabwe. He co-directed the 2018 Zimbabwe International Election Observer Mission and also served as the chief of party for the Carter Center International Observer Project in Zimbabwe through July 2023. And before we get started today and bring in our main speakers, Mentade, I actually wanted to go back to you really quickly because as many people joining today may have seen, you've been working on a really interesting and unique project called Your Ballot Friend. So I wanted to ask you if you could tell us briefly about that initiative, what it aims to accomplish, and why the many Zimbabwean voters, the hundreds who are tuning in today, might find it useful today and in the lead up to election day. Thank you so much, um, Jeff. So basically, when I came up with the Your Ballot Friend concept, my, my thinking was there are so many young people that are actually registered to vote, but don't actually know how the process goes. It could be first-time voters. It could be people that are coming back and maybe are not remembering what actually happens. But also, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the key issues around elections, because I think a lot of young people have this idea of youth participation is showing up on election day and voting. So the entire series is basically designed like a checklist of some sort where I basically then pick it from the concept of harmonized elections in Zimbabwe, what they look like, what young people are voting for, the kind of people being voted for and the different responsibilities they hold so that they're able to distinguish between the different manifestos that they're getting from councillors, MPs and presidents. But also just to highlight the process itself so that when they go to vote on, on the day of voting, they're able to go there prepared and not be turned away because they're at the wrong public station or they came with something that they're not supposed to bring or just some of the things that make it difficult. I wanted it to be a very easy process for them. But I think the most important part was just highlighting the need for post-election engagement among young people to say beyond election day, how do we use our power, our voice and the different skills and knowledge that we have to feed into governance, to feed into development processes in my country. So it's more like your friend telling you how it's done because she's done it before or she knows some people that have been doing it for a while. So that's the design and concept behind it. And that is so important because obviously we know um, elections aren't just about election day itself. It's it's a process and what comes it's all about what comes before, what comes after, building that knowledge and creating better electoral environments going forward. So really quickly, where can people find out more about this? How can they learn more? Um, so if they go to my social media platforms, whether it's here on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn, if they look for Mandatum Lodger 
all the six episodes that are already out have been published but on youtube as well you can actually just go to the playlist that's there on my youtube channel it's mandatum loja look for the playlist that's called your ballad friend and then you can just catch up on this um the different episodes that have gone out the last one is going out tomorrow which is also launching a competition where i'm hoping that young people can mobilize each other and encourage each other to actually show up because i think you know we're excited about the fact that we're registered to vote but i think it's very important to keep that excitement on election day and encourage them to mobilize each other and kind of incentivize that so i'm very excited about the last episode and just election day and seeing how young people mobilize themselves Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Again, really appreciate it. And hopefully those listening in today will find it useful today and going forward. So now let's uh, let's kickstart this conversation. Hope while I see that you're with us, I'd, I'd really like to go uh, to you first, uh, if we may, because back in, in early 2018, President Menangagwa ran for president, promising a raft of major social and economic changes. And this, of course, included free and fair elections and economic reforms and recovery. Uh, We wanted to ask you a sort of a a scene setting question. What has actually happened over the last five years? And is the electoral environment this time around better or worse than it was back then? Uh, Thank you very much, Jeff, uh, for having me. I I think we have to go back to 2008, where there was uh, uh, post-election violence and a rigged election. Um, Then we go to 2013, where things seemed to be normal. The election was rigged, but the the opposition didn't know how it was rigged. Up to now, they don't know how it was rigged. Then we go to 2018, where there was a lot of international goodwill for President Mnangagwa, where he said all the right things, where where the military was able to manipulate the citizens into believing that it is their uh, march, uh, it is their desire, to see a better Zimbabwe for the ordinary men and women in Zimbabwe. Uh, and of course, we were conned, as we now know. Um, then, during the election time itself, uh, or leading up to the elections, uh, it seemed to be peaceful. People were allowed to go and have their rallies. Um, and as we know, there was a problem with uh, the results. Uh, obviously, they, it was rigged. But... Uh, at this time, it was not rigged in a very sophisticated way because if you look at National and Central, you'd find that uh, over 100,000 people are said to vote within 30 to, to, to 60 minutes, which is uh, quite impossible. So it was rigged, but it was rigged in a very crude way. And of course, we had the unfortunate um, uh, event where the military used uh, live ammunition to kill six people. Uh, uh, supposedly protesters. I say supposedly because some of them were said not to be protesting as well. I think there was a woman who was shot because she just unfortunately passed through that area. Um, and 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 then we thought, well, something might happen. The international community thought something different might happen. We had the Motlande uh, Commission. It made uh, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, recommendations which have not uh, been implemented. One of the most important recommendations is to deal with the perpetrators uh, they've not been dealt with or even compensation, it, is, it hasn't been done. And then we started to see the regime unfold in its true colors. Um, the looting of public funds, uh, the plan of the country's natural resources continued um, and in, in 2019, in January, more people were killed, people were beaten up, uh, women were raped, uh, the internet was shut down. The first time uh, such an incident w- w- would happen in, um, in Zimbabwe since the advent of the internet. And then we move forward, the looting of public funds became uh, much more serious, uh, self-evident and brazen. They didn't care anymore. Uh, the plan that continued... Up to now, we know that 150 million or rather more than 150 million US dollars worth of gold is smuggled out. We've been reporting about this for the past five years. We just didn't have the evidence. The evidence came uh, through the four Al Jazeera documentary films, The Gold Mafia, one, two, three, and four. And um, we saw uh, uh, um, stepping up of repression, journalists being thrown into prison for reporting uh, corruption, opposition members being thrown into prison uh, for for speaking out against repression. 
Um, and, and one such guy is Job Scala, who's been in prison for over uh, 14 months. Um, he has no conviction that requires him to be in prison, but he's still in prison, has been denied bail. And uh, we also saw the abuse of the judiciary. The judiciary uh, was being used and continues to be used uh, for political reasons, for political purposes. Uh, people are just locked up. Magistrates are brazen in how they refuse to give bail. You know that if you go as a journalist exposing corruption or an opposition member of parliament or a government critic to the magistrate's court, you are highly unlikely to get bail at all. You can only get bail if you go to the high court, but lately it's becoming uh, the same with the high court as well. We have seen with the job scala case and, and uh, we have seen with uh, the um, uh, Jacob Bungari from a case where he was speaking out against corruption, calling for demonstrations against corruption. He's been locked up for four years. One year, I think, was suspended, so three years in prison. And when he went to the high court to seek bail, he was told that he was not going to get bail. So the judiciary is being used as a hammer by the regime. And it has been far much worse, to answer your question, whether things are becoming worse. It's been far much worse under Emerson Mnangagwa, who is, of course, an enforcer, was an enforcer for Robert Mugabe. But now the guys that were enforcers for Robert Mugabe are now in charge of the system. And they are much more brazen is where Robert Mugabe could have a bit of sophistication because he had a worldview. These guys don't care. They don't have a worldview at all. Uh, so you'd find that when um, someone like a crooked person like Angel, who was appointed as the president's ambassador, ambassador at large, um, uh, was exposed in the way that he was exposed by Al Jazeera, evidence is, is there. Um, they went on to promote him to become an ambassador for the African Union. So they don't really care. Uh, today we saw the uh, deportation of Professor uh, Stephen Chan. Uh, on Thursday we saw the deportation of Chris Maroleng and his uh, colleagues. Professor Stephen Chan was deported apparently because, uh, or supposedly, uh, uh, because he was coming into the country to train, <laughs> to train Triple C guys, uh, martial arts, so that they can cause mayhem. I mean, it, it, one could say where Robert Mugabe was doing crazy things, uh, there was a, an input, there was an intellectual input in, it, in his craziness. With these guys, there's absolutely nothing. They can come and lock you up for speaking on this Twitter space, and nobody will say anything. That's that's the nature of uh, of this regime. So when you compare it to 2018 and now, it's like day and and and, and night. 2018, they were deceiving both Zimbabweans and the international community that they were different from Robert Mugabe, that they would not do what Robert Mugabe used to do, but that deceit. Um, uh, was was exposed on August 1, 2018, when they did what Robert Mugabe had not done before uh, throughout his 37-year history, shooting with live ammunition uh, citizens who are walking in the streets uh, because there's been a protest. That had never happened before, but but they did it. The, 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 the worst that we've had um, in Zimbabwe has been Gukura Hondi. And 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 um, they have been trying to say they are going to be different. They were trying to make amends, and even with Gukra Hondi, which I think Zenzela can speak authoritatively on, they have not made the amends. It has all been cosmetic, trying to deceive the international community to say they are they are they are, they are different. In the midst of trying to have a debt uh, 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 reconciliation done, uh, part of that debt reconciliation demands is the freedom. Of, of speech, the freedom of citizens to uh, exercise the rights that are enshrined in the constitution. And this has been thwarted time and time again, even uh, after that debt uh, restructuring started. And now with these deportations, I, I, I don't see how um, th they are going to explain this, but we'll wait and see how they are going to explain. Thank you very much, Hopewell, for that. I think a lot of people outside of Zimbabwe listening today are probably taken aback to hear 
you and certainly others say that the the situation on many fronts, on the electoral front, the political and socioeconomic fronts are actually worse now than they were under former President Mugabe, who in many respects was the the poster child for for oppression, for political uh, violence um, in 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 Africa. So to hear that it is actually worse off today uh, is is really quite uh, a shock to the system, as it should be. And just really quickly, I wanted to to follow up with you because I know we have a lot of folks in Zimbabwe tuning in, but certainly we have a big international audience as well who might not know the. Um, internal dynamics and the specifics of, of the Zimbabwean elections. So to, to help our listeners who might not know that much about the country and the election, how would you sum up the two presidential, the two main presidential candidates, that is? You mentioned incumbent President Menagagua, but he's also running against uh, a main opposition challenger, Nelson Chamisa. What is the state of the race between those two? And particularly, what is the state of the opposition, which is now uh, being reformulated or has been rather reformulated into the Citizens Coalition for Change? We'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, th thank you, Geoff. I think uh, it, it, the president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, his story is well known. Uh, it has been part and parcel of successive ZANU-PF regimes from 1980 and all the terrible things that happened, uh, most of them, he was close to, to them, uh, like Gukura Hunti, like 2008, uh, post-election violence. Um, he's been part of that. Uh, the other candidate, Nelson Chamisa, who's the main opposition um, uh, presidential candidate in Zimbabwe, is a young guy uh, who went through uh, his training with Morgan Shangrai, starting off as a youth leader of the then Movement for Democratic Change. Um, in 2005, there was a split, uh, which happened because Morgan Shangrai refused to follow the constitution of the MDC. He lost a vote with his national executive regarding the uh, senatorial elections. And that led to the split of the Movement for Democratic Change with Welshman Nube and uh, Deft Coltart going with the other um, um, members who were opposed to what Morgan Changrai had done. And Morgan Changrai, Tendai BT, and um, uh, Morgan Changrai, Tendai BT, and Nelson Shamisa and, and remaining with the rest of, the, uh, of, of their cohort. Then in 2008, of course, Morgan Shangri won the election by 73%. Uh, the election was rigged. There was post-election violence, which forced him to pull out. And uh, that resulted in a government of national unity. Uh, he became prime minister, uh, and, and um, Nelson Chamisa became the ICT minister, information technology guy, uh, in the government, in cabinet. And then in 2013, um, they were they were they were rigged. They were uh, rigged by Zanu PF. They don't know, as I said, how it was done. Um, then in 2014, the, the Congress, uh, Nelson Chamisa was tr trying to be Secretary General of the party, and uh, Morgan Shangrai blocked him, um, literally rigged him, um, and 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 made sure that uh, Monzora won. I'm told that the reason was that. Uh, he, he had become uh, bigger for Morgan's liking. Uh, that's why he was rigged. And then in um, 2015, Morgan Shangrai appointed him. Uh, what many lawyers said was in legal process because the appointment of the vice president should have been done through the Congress. But Morgan Shangrai appointed him nonetheless. Uh, him and uh, Muzuri. So he ended up with three vice pre presidents. So when Morgan Shangrai died in uh, 2018, uh, February 14, uh, their constitution said um, the, the vice president should take over. Uh, it didn't speak of which vice president because there was no uh, three vice presidents in the constitution. There was one vice president. And that vice president who had been elected by their Congress was Tokozan Kope. Um, Nelson found his way and he became the leader of the party. Um, and, and as he has always maintained, he feels that the election was uh, was rigged, the numbers did not make sense, and, and the evidence um, was there in court, but obviously uh, after after the court ruling, he said he did not agree with the court. Um, he was vindicated because the same courts continued to make uh, rulings which were dubious, 
rulings which were questionable, and uh, it ended up making rulings which were unconstitutional. Like, for instance, the uh, extension of the term of the uh, uh, the current CJ. Um, it was it, it's clearly unconstitutional. But anyway, the courts ruled that it was constitutional. Um, his party was destroyed. Uh, Monzora became the leader of the party using the courts. Uh, and, and Nelson Shamisa had to re rebuild. Um, some might call it rebrand. I would like to say that he started a new party, um, Citizens for uh, Coalition Change. And, and um, he is where we are now because of all those things that happened in the past. So it's quite evident, Jeff, that if President Mnangagwa struggled, scraped through, uh, avoided a runoff with 31,000 votes, when he had so much international goodwill, when he had so much support even from unlikely sources within the country, a big vote came from people who thought he should be given a chance. Um, when, when, when everybody wanted him to, to, to succeed. And then he comes back five years later. Uh, Zimbabwe has now got the highest inflation in the world. Uh, there is no working radiotherapy machine in the country. So people with cancer are dying. There is no uh, heart bypass machine, both in the private and public sector. Uh, there are no medicines in hospitals. Uh, central hospitals don't have basic me medicines like uh, IV paracetamol. 95% uh, unemployment in Zimbabwe. 2,500 women die every year giving birth. The biggest hospital has got only one maternity theater. Um, uh, roads are potholed. There's no clean drinking water in ab most urban homes. There's no clean drinking water. Even in affluent areas, they have to drill uh, bowls. Schools do not have uh, the schools do not have uh, uh, the required books. Um, uh, we've had uh, long periods of load shedding, eighteen hours, sometimes twenty two hours load shedding, um, and the, the 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 local currency called RTGS, the Zimbabwean dollar, uh, collapsed. They've had to manipulate it so that they can scrape through the elections, and then um, it will collapse again. We know that. Uh, and so many things. But the biggest thing, Jeff, is the looting of public funds and the plunder of the country's natural resources. Um, the looting has just been on steroids. The stealing, imagine you they import a land cruiser into Zimbabwe. They pay maybe 80000 to 100000 max for it. They will uh, put it down uh, and, and, and ask the Reserve Bank to pay 400000 U.S., for a car that would have cost 8000 You know, two, a couple of days ago, they brought in fire engines from Belarus. Those fire engines cost about 150000 max each. Uh, and, and if you go online, you can see that Mongolia bought them. Uh, it, it bought a, 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 a better version than what we got, and it paid about 150000 each. Zimbabwe is paying 400, over 430,000 each. So they are stealing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why you find that hospitals do not have ambulances, but ZANU-PF could afford to buy a brand new car for every MP. So in other words, ZANU-PF makes more money than the state. And because of that, we have had what is literally a collapsed state where they cannot um, fund public services. So I don't find it plausible that in a remotely free and fair and credible election, Nelson Chamisa will lose. Uh, I, I, I don't see that. And But but when he loses, he also needs to take um, um, the mistakes that he has made. For instance, what I said i know the opposition supporters don't like to hear this but we are analysts we are journalists we, we we don't have to say things that people love us to say but we have to say things for what they are um as you saw yesterday he was in blawayo he didn't have his main lieutenants washman nube who comes from that region was not there with him tendai Biti, the vice president another vice president was not there with him so that in itself would have weakened his base it will further uh, show when the election is rigged, 
and he has to start fighting uh, that rigging of the election. You won't have a strong team to send around the region. Who does he send to AU? Who does he send to South Africa? All those things are important. And quietly, ZANU-PF is happy with what happened when, when the other guys were pushed aside because they realize that it weakens him. They realize that it weakens um, uh, his charge if the election is rigged. And which I think is already rigged because rigging is a process. Um, he has been denied over 100 rallies. That's staggering for any main opposition political party to be denied 100 rallies. That's, that's out of this world because of MOPA. Um, ZANU PF could go and campaign anyway. Some of his supporters. Um, have been killed in Kwe Kwe, March 26 by elections in 2022. Um, there's a guy that was killed uh, this time around in Glenview. Someone was killed again. And you can see the different treatments that are given uh, to ZANU PF and Triple C by the police and the judiciary. When, when, when the 40, uh, when, when the people that were responsible. Uh, for the for the killing uh, in Glenview, were rounded up. Uh, they were given bail. When uh, the, the forty people that had not beaten anyone or any done anything to anybody who belonged to Triple C, they are still uh, locked up. Uh, so, so you can see that the judiciary is used by ZANU PF in many ways to one maintain its grip on power to make sure that it it doesn't lose its grip on power, and secondly to make sure that it becomes a difficult um, environment for people to operate in. Not just politicians, but even journalists like myself. I've been to prison three times inside six months uh, on bogus charges, laws that don't exist. Are, are said to exist and you go for almost three years going to court on the basis of something that doesn't exist on the basis of a charge that's bogus so it makes it difficult to operate in such an environment that is why it's important for nelson to have a cohesive and very strong opposition party um because fighting zanu pf is a big job zanu pf is a monster it's not a, a walk in the park Thank you so much, um, Hopo, for providing such an expanded context to um, the, the election environment in Zimbabwe and just the lead up to it, especially for those that are not too familiar with um, the environment in Zim. We're getting a lot of speaking requests from the audience and we appreciate the interest. So we had said earlier for those that joined a bit later that at the end of the session in which the panelists that we have are giving their insights, we're going to open up the conversation to the audience for you to share your reflections, your questions. So please keep those questions in your reflections for that, for that time of the conversation. I'd also want to say that you can also just use the comment section to just share your thoughts, your questions, and all of the other things, just in case you forget, but also just to keep the conversation there. Because with the number of requests that we're getting, I'm not too sure we're going to be able to just take everybody. And then also just a reminder to the audience to share your thoughts and reflections um, on your timelines. You can use Resist Bureau Live, you can take us, and then we'll be able to just share that conversation. So, Rosalind, I want to come to you next because one of the things we know is a basic precondition for a credible election is respect for human rights. So I want you to come in and maybe share with us what has been the human rights situation over the last months leading to this election and what do you expect as we get closer to the polling day? Thank you uh, and good evening to uh, the listeners and uh, the fellow speakers. Maybe what I would want to really concentrate on um, as we move uh, to 23 August is... Um, just uh, some violations that we've been observing over the last few weeks, particularly violations that are being caused by uh, lack of respect of the Constitution. And I would really want to just zero in on the issues around civic space. For those uh, that have been following Zimbabwean elections uh, from 2008, 2013, 2018, you'd know that uh, Zimbabwe is a vibrant civil society. But over the last few weeks, you can also note that um, activities of civil society have been subdued. And this uh, is mainly because of um, some laws that have either been introduced or some laws that have been proposed um, and uh, that have already been passed by parliament, but have not yet uh, been signed into law by the president. 
And the laws that I would want to just highlight uh, and zero in on include uh, the amendment to the Criminal Law Codification and Reform Act, which is also known as uh, the Patriotic Act, uh, which was signed into law in July, and also the Private Voluntary Organizations Amendment Bill, which was passed by Parliament um, at the end of um, January, beginning of February, but has not yet uh, been signed into law. Well, that is what uh, we have been advised in the public domain. So the impact of these two laws uh, has been uh, to curtail uh, the possibility of um, activism by many civil society organizations during the past uh, elections and even during this electoral cycle. So they've been active in monitoring what is happening in the communities, particularly when it comes to whether the political parties are adhering to the code of conduct that is provided for in the Electoral Act, uh, whether they actually are adhering to the standards of um, complying with uh, provisions that uh, prevent them from vote buying, um, violence, or any other electoral malpractices. So we have uh, many civil society organizations that are not fully operational, mainly because some of uh, these organizations have tried to comply with these laws in advance, uh, such as the Private Voluntary Organizations Amendment Bill, because these laws are already being applied on the ground even before they've become laws. So the restrictions that we see when it comes to civic space is uh, freedom of association, uh, particularly for civil society organizations. And then we also see issues of freedom of assembly uh, for the opposition party supporters. And in terms of uh, the um, private voluntary organizations amendment bill that is at an advanced stage, the impact of this law is to increase the control of the executive over the operations of civil society organizations, uh, the registration process, and basically how civil society organizations can operate in the country as the minister or the registrar can take over the running of organizations. So we have seen several organizations uh, self-censoring uh, as they do not want to be seen to be politically incorrect as they move uh, towards trying to ensure that they are registered as private voluntary organizations. And then when we look at uh, the Patriotic Act, uh, the amendments to the criminal code, these basically are criminalizing free speech, uh, freedom of expression, where we have very vague uh, provisions, uh, such as willfully damaging the sovereignty or national interest, where the national interest is not defined. And if one is found to have uh, violated these provisions, they can basically be sentenced to life in prison or to the death penalty. So that is uh, just how serious uh, in terms of uh, restrictions of civic space and violations of particularly the rights to freedom of expression, uh, freedom of speech, association and assembly have been as we move towards uh, 23 August. And this is unprecedented. We have not had a situation in the past elections where the operations of civil society uh, these are the issues that I just wanted um, to zero in on, particularly as we move towards uh, 23 August. Um, thank you so much, Roslyn. And I was just nothing um, interestingly to my colleague Jeff that there are so many roadshows happening right now, even in my constituency in Kulumane, there is music everywhere. There is, it's just chaos. <laughs> I just wanted to make reference to that. So, Roslyn, I think one of the things that I'm really interested to know is when we speak about human rights violations, especially around election season, in a lot of instances, it's a reference made to people that are often known or people that already have some form of access to support in the case that they fall in any way under threat or they've been violated. But then there are also people who experience a lot of violation that don't actually know 
um, that they can actually do something about it, that they can report on it so that it's properly documented and they can potentially get support. So one of the questions I'm very interested to know, um, based on the work that you're doing and the work that you're seeing within um, different parts of Zimbabwe by different people, what kind of mechanisms are in place for reporting, documenting and responding to human rights violations ahead of on election day and potentially after election day? So we have uh, various uh, options uh, for those who may be victims of human rights violations to report. Uh, they can basically report to some of the civil society organizations that are active in their communities, if there are any that are active in their communities. Uh, there are some organizations that are also monitoring violence uh, around the country, and some of the organizations that are doing this work include uh, the Zimbabwe Peace Project. I also believe... Um, some of the organizations uh, with uh, the speakers on this platform are also working uh, on uh, assisting any victims of um, violence or any other violations that may okay. I believe that Senzele's site uh, is also on the ground documenting in certain regions. And then we also have um, a Chapter 12 institution, which is uh, the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission, that is also supposed to be receiving uh, reports of uh, human rights violations and any other politically motivated violence and they should actually be acting on some of those reports uh, the other organizations are law-based organizations uh, like uh, Zimbabwe lawyers for human rights uh, we have hotlines uh, we also have uh, organizations that are working on children's issues and we also have organizations such as the women in law support uh, that are working on women's um, issues and others that are monitoring election-related issues, such as the Zimbabwe election support. So I would encourage citizens uh, or any other people that are victims of violations to get in touch with the civil society organizations, including the community-based organizations in their communities, uh, and even sometimes to get in touch with some of the community radio stations because they know uh, the organizations that they can refer them to. And if they can get in touch with uh, the Human Rights Commission, they can also get in touch with the Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Really appreciate that broad perspective, but also local remedies for some of the issues that we expect uh, to continue to, to transpire this week. So thank you very much for that submission. Zinzale, I'd really like to pivot to you now because another thing we know, of course, is that critical for a free and fair is access to information and media freedom. We heard from Hopewell uh, at the very outset um, that there have been serious infringements on not only local journalists working in Zimbabwe, but also international media workers who've been denied entry or deported recently. Uh, we know that Voice of America, Al Jazeera, the New York Times, among others, have not had their reporters given the proper accreditation to, to report on events as they're occurring. So as one of those journalists, citizen journalists working at the grassroots level, how would you personally assess the state of Zimbabwean media in the context of this election? And what issues should those of us on the outside looking in be monitoring this week? Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the, the colleagues that have uh, talked have highlighted some of the issues that the challenge that we have in Zimbabwe, um, especially when you look at uh, the media freedom, when you look at the violations that happen. But what is worrying for me as a journalist is the number of journalists that have not been able to, uh, you know, get accreditation to, to, to come and, and observe where, uh, the, the, the elections. We, we have quite a number of people who attend away for for whatever reason that uh, the government says i don't think it it, it paints the, the the picture well because uh, if people are coming in why not just allow them to come in uh do their work and and, and they go so the, the people always ask what is it that uh, uh, you know you are hiding but over the years i think one of the issues that we should look at uh, as zimbabwe or in zimbabwe is the the kind of government that we have now is different from uh, the, the mugabe government the way they operate is very different. These guys use a new form of cohesion and, 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 and more of co-option. So people get co-opted into the system uh, for doing various things. But those who don't get co-opted into the system then get, you know, uh, the, the, the violence or, the, or they, they get arrested or, or something like that. So I find that journalists largely 
uh, a, a lot of them, just like civil society, people self-censor. So you find that Zimbabwean journalists are uh, mainly most of them, and, and, and uh, they, 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 they are doing their stories. They are moving around, and you you know you would have people would have an idea that okay, if this is a no-go area for me. Uh, this story, I'll, 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 I'll receive it and I'll ignore it because they, they they are worried mostly about what would happen later on. So th there is a lot of self-censorship, and this is mainly because of the laws like, uh, you know, the Patriotic, uh, which is the Criminal Codification Act. This is because of, uh, you know, there, there, there are quite a number of laws that are there that make journalists, uh, you know, worry or get scared of, of certain stories. So you, you hardly find the Zimbabwean journalists, you know, writing the Al Jazeera kind of uh, investigations or what has been done by Sentry mainly because of the, the issue of fear. So looking at uh, from a side point of view, we have been doing stories, uh, we have been reporting uh, on what is going on, we've been documenting cases uh, of uh, intimidation, cases of uh, you know, harassment that happen. And I think we have, we, we have, we have done that without any uh, uh, physical harm or any challenges, but we do know the limits. I think we do know that the, the, there are dangers that we, we, the danger is always there. So I find that with this government, there's more of surveillance uh, that, that happens. There's more of preemptive strikes. You, you find those stories in the Herald that talks about, and so we've been so much, we, I mean, side personally, we've been a lot of victims of fake news where you get stories that the US embassy is given uh, civil society and media $2 million. Uh, this has happened. And, and so th th there is a, a method to the madness. So it's not out in the open. It's not something that you say, you know, a journalist has been, uh, he has been, has been, you know, beaten up or you know, something like this has happened. But they, they, they are, they're very clever. I think if, if you look at uh, this election and maybe the, the, the scholars that study politics would have to look at how, you know, FAS uh, would have influenced the way people vote, the way people do things. Because the, 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 there is this unwritten, uh, you know, rule or the, the, there is this, you know, fear uh, amongst people that uh, probably there's someone who's looking at me. And unfortunately, it's so sad that I'm not sure what it is, that civil society that is supposed to be protecting people have also somehow been, I, I guess maybe it's because of lack of funding, that you find that the civil society that you're supposed to trust, that you're supposed to work with, have become, for a lack of a better, it's niches. They are the people who then run to, to intelligence organizations to say so and so is doing this, so and so. So you don't feel safe with anyone. So you, you're better off at home. You're better off, you know, just doing your work and not sharing with anyone whatever you're doing. So that is, I think this government has managed to very well to, 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 to cut, tell the power of civil society uh, to make sure that they don't work together. And I think the PVO bill is more effective when it is not law. Because right now, everyone who, you know, I've covered elections since, since 2000. And we always been busy with, um, you know, reports from civil society, with press conferences, with meetings, with workshops. I was saying to my guys the other day, so which the election days as a paling as an year for an election workshop. And and I was saying to my guys, so you mean to tell me that the election will come and go without me going to Arare to attend an election workshop? Because there's no civil society organization that is doing that. They are already worried about their existence. They are worried about the PVO bill. And the PVO bill before it becomes law, it has already shaped the way people think how where was the last statement you saw a press uh, or the last time you saw a press statement from civil society condemning anything uh to do with elections to do with the voters role to do with uh, you know the processes of elections so this is the same thing that works with the media so people are very careful what they they, 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 they do and at that point when it's like that people people easily get targeted so this is why the government will say, okay, make sure that Chan does not come into the country because he was going to cause us problems. Make sure Chris does not get the accreditation and he doesn't do the work, whatever work he wants to do. And we, they're more comfortable with us here and those who are there because we, we are not going to say much. We're going to report what we see and we, we leave the rest to other people. 
thank you very much, Zinzale, for that. I just have a quick follow-up question for you, a bit unrelated um, to, to what we've just been discussing. You know, I find it really interesting so often that authorities in Zimbabwe and elsewhere have this narrative that, you know, the language around free and fair, credible, transparent elections are somehow being imposed on them by by the outside, by the West, uh, by by other forces outside of Zimbabwe. And, you know, I think we have to remind people that there are certain international conventions that exist. First and foremost among them is the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, which was actually adopted by the African Union back in 2007. And it was the first binding document adopted by members of the AU. Many people might know that President Menangagwa himself signed this African Charter on Democracy in, in 2018. And it was ratified just last year in June of 2022. And if you read the document, you know, it's full of beautiful prose and language about the necessity uh, of free and fair elections and upholding the values that underpin that, including uh, Chapter 7, which is all about democratic elections. And it talks about some of the issues you were just raising, access to state-controlled media, a free landscape in which free association and expression is protected, uh, the establishment and strengthening of independent national electoral bodies. So I wanted to ask you, how does this narrative still prevail somehow that these are imposed values and not actually commitments that the government itself has made at the international level and thereby should be held accountable. So how does this, number one, how does that narrative prevail? And number two, you know, is, is it possible to, to hold authorities in Zimbabwe and repressive governments elsewhere accountable uh, for their actions when in fact they've made these agreements not only with their African counterparts, but with the international community? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, Zimbabweans should do is to really um, read the constitution, the electoral laws, and I, for some reason, I, I find this this election uh, it was interesting in courts in the sense that a lot of people were going to court to try and uh, uh, you know, ascertain their rights. Never mind the the outcome. But people were going to courts to say the constitution says this, the electoral law says this. Zimbabwe is a signatory to the SADC guidelines, to the AU. There are expectations at SADC level, at AU level, at international level on what is a basis of a free and fair election. You know, simple things like access to the media for, for the candidates, you know, candidates being free to campaign, uh, freedom of association. And I, I always like the way I find it funny that Zek would actually list the things that are illegal, you know, vote buying, intimidation, and all those kinds of things. So they know what is wrong. But then when you then report that but there is vote buying that is happening there, there is a video of an MP that is circulating here telling uh, you know, residents or villagers that we will know who you vote for. All of a sudden, there is no one who implements that or who goes to actually make sure that uh, the person is arrested. So uh, th 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 there is always this fear that it is the West that is going to tell people, I don't need the West to tell me what to do, what is right and what... I don't need the West to tell me that Kukuraund was wrong and it was a genocide. As much as I find it nauseating that with the opposition as well, when you point out the things that they do wrong, then you are an PF. So I think we, we need to learn to say we can agree and disagree without insulting each other. And what is good is what Zimbabweans need to do is to just follow the law. What does the Electoral Act say when it comes to voter education, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the polling stations, number of polling stations? And people need to somehow have, hold the government accountable. To a larger extent, people in social media have done that. There are videos that circulate. There are things that people say on social media. And you find, you know, the police, ZEC, the government, releasing press statements, reacting to, 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 to what the people would have said. So that is a way of holding uh, the government to, uh, to, to account. But how do we work together to make sure that the laws that are there are implemented? But it's not, it's not easy, uh, you think, because those cases that are supposed to be decided uh, in court, like if you look at the Kasukure case, 
largely the, the, the case was dismissed on technicalities and the, the merits of the case were not uh, discussed. So that, those are some of the, the, the challenges that, that we find. But I think above all, we need to learn as Zimbabweans. I don't know which school can, we can go to to learn to disagree without insulting each other, to learn to be tolerant, to learn that people can have a different view and they won't be an enemy. So I can disagree with ZANU. It doesn't mean that I'm now a, a puppet of the West. And that, that 19, I don't know, it comes way back in the 1963s. It comes to 1980. It comes to 2000, if you didn't agree, or, or to the 80s, if you didn't agree with the, the government in the 80s, we were dissident. If you didn't agree with the government in the 2000s, you were sell out. And right now, if you don't agree with the government, either you're a puppet of the West. But unfortunately, the opposition have, have gone on that bandwagon as well. If you don't agree with them, you are a ZANPF person. You know, you want to see people on Twitter say, you have been bought. What the fuck is that? Sorry. Well, but that, that, that the kind of intolerance that I find with Zimbabweans. I think we need to learn to be tolerant so that if we don't respect ourselves, this government will not really respect us. Thank you so much, um, Zenzele. Um, Namatai, I want to bring you into the conversation. One of the things that we've talked about in African elections is the role of the youth, given that African societies are so young. Today, for instance, Zambia is applauded for the powerful role of the youth in the election that saw President Hakainde Ichilema transition to office. What is the mood of young people in Zimbabwe right now where this election is concerned? And what is the importance of the youth vote in this election? Okay, um, thank you very much, Mantante. And I'm, I feel very privileged to be speaking after uh, such amazing speakers who have really built into the context um, and I think just focusing on youth, um, I'll just start by saying that the first thing that we need to be cognizant of is that 70% um, uh, of sub-Saharan Africans are below the age of 30. Uh, and more than 69% of Zimbabwe's population are actually young people, with young women constituting the demographic majority, and this is according to ZimStats. Um, having said that, we need to appreciate that youth are not a homogeneous group. Um, you've got youth in rural areas, youth in urban areas, young men, young women, um, Gen Zs, millennials, all of these are young people and they have different priorities. And that is something we ought to be very cognizant of um, as we reflect on the youth question uh, in Zimbabwe and particularly in relating uh, to the 2023 election. Um, having said that, um, I just wanted to start by, you know, placing this conversation around the context, the chaos and the complexity around youth participation. And I will start by saying that uh, the state in itself um, has been over the last couple of years, reimagining and rebranding as well as recreating itself into a paramilitary state uh, that is palatable for civilian consumption and particularly uh, a younger civilian. Um, basically, uh, 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 the state has been seeking to appeal to young people, to a young civilian. Um, and this has made the environment very, very complex with a lot of blurred lines between what are civilian interests and what are military in interests. Um, I mean, we look at this from the perspective of the music, um, how they're infusing it in the music. We've had the military touch movement. Um, we have had um, um, issues to do with agriculture. Uh, basically, command agriculture. We've had command health. Right now, the current Minister of Health um, is a former military general. Um, you know, education, business, mining. We are seeing the military continuously and gradually enforce its tentacles in all of these areas that are so critical uh, to sustain this particular young um, uh, uh, citizenry that we now have uh, in Zimbabwe. And I will just give you very vivid um um, a very vivid examples, particularly uh, when we then look at how the state is also infusing itself in a lot of our cultural elements like uh, education, religion, the arts, language, uh, economic system, social organizing, tradition, uh, you know, our values and norms, but also our music, which is also an essential part uh, of the elements of culture. All of these things are things that young people interact with on a daily basis and are also fundamentally important in terms of um, shaping what we call the popular culture. And we have seen an appetite by the state to infuse itself uh, and to also work and uh, collude with a lot of what we call the socialites, the popular people that young people really look up to and listen to as part of its campaign. I mean, recently we have seen people like Holly Tan, we have seen people like, uh, 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 I think her name is Kiki Badass, 
us who have been actively uh, uh, participating in processes of campaigning for that particular regime. And these are young people, um, and these are young people that are being fronted to show how cool it is to support uh, a particular regime. Um, we've also had issues to do with the Mbinga phenomenon. You know, Mbinga and Zimbabwe are these individuals who are extremely influential, extremely popular, extremely wealthy, but they cannot account for that wealth. Uh, some of them are religious leaders, some of them are just socialites, but all of these individuals um, are part of uh, creating a very, very strong ring of corruption that has broken the Zimbabwean promise. The Zimbabwean promise in the past was that if you worked very hard, uh, if you got an education, no matter where you went in the world, no matter where you went in the country, did not matter, you came from a rural area and you were very poor, that education, that hard work would open endless opportunity, limitless possibilities for you simply because you were hardworking and you were educated. But nowadays it's about connections and particularly the Mbingas, they really, really funnel that. These are individuals that have connections, have dirty connections in particular, but cannot explicate their work through accountable systems and also through hard work. So these are some of the things that are shaping the context in terms of how youth participate. Of course, other issues like alcohol and substance abuse, which have really taken the center stage uh, around issues to do with youth participation, and also issues to do with violent, organized cartels that also attract young people. You talk about the Mashurugi, for instance, um, artisanal miners. I know Dr. Grashen Mokodzongi has uh, called them a kind of uh, 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 protest group to elit, elit capture of natural resources, but we have seen a tendency that some of these Mashurugis, who are usually young people, late teens, early 20s, being instrumentalized to actually attack people for political violence. And I think what is very, very sad about the violence situation is that we've had an influx of arms. People now have access to arms, which was never the case under Robert Mugabe. Um, whenever there are disputes, people shot each other and you wonder where are they getting the guns. And this is something that is very characteristic in our context and also affecting young people. We also look at the weaponization of the judiciary um, um, towards young people. Uh, the National Youth Service, uh, which is this violent group that was disbanded and now it was brought back by the current Minister of Youth, um, as well as issues to do uh, uh, with how all of these things feed into creating uh, uh, you know, a climate that makes it difficult for young people to really participate uh, meaningfully and effectively. So what I will say, though, is that um, uh, given this whole context, including also conversations around migration, um, I was having conversations with a lot of organizations that do elections work and asking them to really, really observe how the migration situation in Zimbabwe has affected uh, the, electoral, the, the election process. Uh, some registered voters probably left the country, some probably are still leaving the country, um, and we have to really reflect on how that is affecting participation. So, um, can I speak? I think the host had muted me. Yes, you can. Okay, so thank you, Mantanti. So having said all of this, and particularly giving a context in, in, in how these are critical issues that are affecting uh, uh, young people in a very political sense, it's important to actually highlight that, um, you know, a lot of people have debated the conversation around youth participation from the premise of apathy. You know, people have often said that youth don't want to participate, uh, youths are not interested. But I think in this particular election, we have seen, um, um, uh, you know, somewhat a contrary to that particular view. And I think it's also very important for us to not only view youth as unwilling to participate, but to also look at the systemic and structural impediments that have been put in place that make it difficult for young people to participate, regardless of which political party you're thinking of. Um, I mean, from an apathy perspective, of course, you do have sections of young people who will tell you that, you know, even if I vote, what is it going to change? It doesn't matter. But you also have young people who have an appetite to show up. And we have seen this uh, with young people wanting to show up as candidates. We saw this particularly during the nomination process that the CCC had and also the ZANU PF primary elections, where we had a significant number of young people forwarding themselves to actually say, we are ready to take up public office leadership. Um, and you know the fact that we don't have a lot of young people showing up um, on, on this particular 
election and particularly uh, uh, being voted for is something very systemic uh, and something that is deeply in, enshrined in the ageistic but also very patriarchal normative frameworks within the political parties themselves. And that is work we need to also discuss and do more uh, uh, to, to actually ensure that young people are better represented in political parties, young people have space, and also we disrupt those ageistic normative frameworks to actually encourage more youth participation. So, you know, you look at it from other you know impediments systemically. We had issues to do with IDs that young people actually struggled to get. We had issues to do with how difficult at some point it was for young people to actually register to vote. Of course, we did have the blitz, which made it easier for people to vote, increasing the number of registered voters to about 6.6 million this year. All of these things um, are, are looking at the critical issues as to why sometimes young people do not actually end up showing up to participate. Um, and I would also then say the issues around violence, uh, particularly for young women, it becomes very difficult for them to participate. And we've seen that in this particular election. I know there are individuals who have argued that this election has been peaceful. Uh, but in my view, I, I see that there has been violence. And some of this violence has been very direct. Some of it has been very indirect. Some of this violence has been loud. Some of this violence has been very subtle. But there has been violence. And I think depending on where you are and where you stand, we saw that some of this violence was very targeted to young people, to particularly young women. Uh, we've had issues of people being abducted. We have had people issues of people being tortured. We have had those issues of you know students being arrested, detained pre-trial. I mean, we had the Zanasu students who were arrested, particularly in the issues of demanding jobs to colors released from prison. So all of these are some of the characteristic issues that make it very difficult for young people to participate. And I will end it by saying that we. We need to also have a very holistic construct in terms of what violence actually look like. Violence sometimes is social, it's economic, it's political, um, it's digital, it's psychological. Um, we have seen what we call the Varakashi, you call them trolls in English, who have been basically deployed um, on our digital platforms. Um, and some of these people attack, you know, young people, they attack women. Um, uh, but sometimes, you know, the attacks are quite sexualized. It's very sexualized narrative peddling. And all of these things do impede uh, participation, particularly among the young. We've also seen issues to do with young people being isolated from accessing economic opportunity, young people being isolated socially because of their their activism, their participation in the electoral process, open participation in the electoral process. So all of these things, uh, you know, brought together, create an atmosphere that makes it very difficult for young people to show up, to participate meaningfully and effectively. However, we have seen a very strong appetite uh, from certain groups of young people to still show up, to still register to vote, to still encourage others to register to vote. Um, I can name uh, so many youth organizations. Project Vote 263 has been doing excellent work to mobilize people to vote. Uh, the organization where I work from, we lead young people. We're encouraging uh, people to register to vote and to show up on voting day in the communities. Um, that really inspires hope because amidst all of that, the shrinking of, uh, of, of civic space, where a lot of people are dissuaded from participating, are, keep, are keeping quiet about critical issues and not organizing within the communities, there are these brave young people who are still consistently showing up uh, and still doing the work. So at the end of the day, I think my verdict uh, relating to the uh, participation of young people uh, uh, in this particular election is, um, of course, it has been very difficult to organize. It was a difficult terrain, difficult context, but the appetite is to show up to participate is there uh, in certain uh, uh, camps of young people. Um, and I think there is still significant work that needs to be done to ensure that young people develop a very strong appetite uh, you know, to electoral process, not just in 2023, the way we saw young people in Zambia do it. I think I'll stop here for now. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Namatai, for that very broad context um, that kind of paints a picture of the environment within which young people are entering this election. I was actually going to ask you to say, in this complex environment, what is the role of the agency of young people and how is it informing the way that they are actually showing up to participate? I think you touched on it a little bit, but you can feel free to just expand on that. My other question was going to relate to the fact that Zimbabwe introduced a youth quota system where 10 seats have in this election been reserved for young people. So I was actually going to ask, like, what do you see as the likely outcome of this pilot youth quota? And how does it feed into the pool of youth that are actually campaigning for office through the ballot? Um, okay, so so thank you so much for for that question, Mantante. Um, so I think I'll just start by addressing the youth quota issue. Um, so we need to really understand the context of how and why the youth quota came into being. 
When we look at 2018, we had six young people who were elected into parliament, and of those six, only one remains in parliament, and that is Honorable Joanna Momombe. Um, that meant that in 2018, of all the elected individuals, less than 2.65% were young people under the age of 35. In a country where 67.9% of that population are young people, having a representation of under 3% is just unacceptable. So we also do know that the 2018 election was centered around youth and the zest and the enthusiasm of politicians around organizing youth has actually increased. And we saw this particularly with the youth quarter that was introduced. So the context of the youth quarter that was introduced is it was introduced under the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 2. And it was one of the little trinkets that was used to market that particular amendment to the Constitution as being progressive. Women and youth were basically used to, uh, you know, basically amend the Constitution, put all these provisions that are violating human rights, that are weakening the judiciary and weakening parliament. And they said that this particular amendment to the Constitution was good because it gave youth 10 seats and it gave women, uh, you know, an extension of the women's quarter. So, you know, having mentioned this, we as an organization, so many young people, we protested the amendment of the Constitution and we had a conversation with the Minister of Justice. We met him, we talked to him. And we, you know, had the privilege of asking him, you know, this particular amendment to the Constitution was an executive inspired bill. In the exec executive, there are no young people, there are no young women, it is old people and particularly old men. Who told these people to forward a proposal to amend the Constitution and give young people 10 seats? Is that what, what young people want? Did they consult them? Did they consult young people to ensure that uh, they are also willing to have 10 seats as, a, you know, as fixing the problem to their underrepresentation? And the only response we had was that we consulted youth in Zanopiev, which I doubt they even did. So basically, these individuals are forwarding a tokenistic, um, a sympathetic uh, system that is meant to increase the numbers of young people participating. But we have learned with the women's quarter, but quarter systems do not actually work. And sometimes they actually serve the reverse. Uh, we saw with the women's quarter that women who now want to, to run for constituencies were told that you will get your seats in the women's quarter. And we actually saw women uh, who ran for public office, the numbers of women running for public office, dwindling, reducing the moment the women's quarter was introduced. Even women who used to run for office in the past and actually won elections no longer went to run for office. They would just get in through the women's quarter. And some of them had two terms uh, uh, in that particular women's quarter. Um, um, and these were politically experienced women. And yet we knew that that particular women's quarter was meant for young, uh, you know, inexperienced people who were supposed to actually learn the workings of things. So these were some of the problematic aspects of the quarter system whereby it took away attention from the real issues that are systemic and structural, that are ageistic and patriarchal, that are, you know, making it difficult for young people and particularly young women to participate meaningfully and effectively in the mainstream to contest for those 210 seats. Um, and with particular reference to the youth quarter, it has no gender mechanism. So we could be having all young men. It has no disability mechanism. So it could not even re be representing youth with disability. It is also not open to independent young people. So it is only accessible to youth and political parties which is also very problematic. So all of these challenges emanate from the youth quarter. Uh, and instead of having a youth quarter, we must actually look to say, how can we have youth-friendly electoral reforms that make it easier for young people to, to disrupt ageistic normative frameworks and for them to actually, you know, uh, uh, get into public office, the, you know, the normal way? You know, and a recommendation could be having a law that mandates political parties, but if they are to be eligible to contest in an election, they must submit 50% of their candidates um, as young people under the age of 35, just as a general rule of, 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 of contesting. Uh, you know, and I, I've always said this, once that's done, you would realize that in urban areas, Zanopia will forward their youth candidates. In rural areas, probably the CCC would forward their youth candidates uh, because, again, it's those manifestations of ageism within a party context where 
whereby you know young people are, are relegated to those roles where they don't actually win, where they and they don't have the resources to contest it, they don't have the political muscle to contest it, and there's also usually a lot of gatekeeping. So we need to actually challenge this political party systems as opposed to having a cosmetic and tokenistic fix. Of course, we'll take the ten seats that young women are getting in the women's quarter and the ten seats that they're getting in the youth quarter, but that should not be the end of the conversation. We must actually do more to increase space for youth. And then the final conversation. Um, you know, around uh, some of the some of some of the issues that are that are emanating in terms of uh, youth organizing um, in this particular election. Um, I think it's very, very important for us to, uh, you know, be cognizant of of the context, you know, what youth want, how they are organizing is hinged on what youth want. Um, and we have seen that this conversation around what youth want uh, can only be held in the context um, um, of, of their socioeconomic rights, the acquisition of their socioeconomic rights. Um, you know, young people want good lives. They want jobs. They want opportunities to be, to exist and be happy. Young people want to live in environments that allow them to explore their capabilities and to be whatever they can be. They want to dream. They want to, you know, live in a country where they have food, water, you know, proper sanitation, you know, Young people want uh, to live in a country where there are good roads. Young people want to live in a country, uh, you know, where they are free from torture, free from, um, you know, a persecution based on their political, you know, affiliation, based on, on, on their religious affiliation. Young people want all of these fundamental rights. And sometimes they might not call them rights. They might not refer them as rights enshrined in Chapter 4 uh, of the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights. But they are clear in terms of what they actually want. And if they're not getting it here, they're willing to actually cross over, get it somewhere else. Um, and it, it then, you know, brings about the question of agency. How badly do young people want these things that they are willing to challenge the system, to create the agency to challenge the system, to ensure that they get some of these things? And I think it comes back to what I described earlier, that there are a lot of push and pull factors that have really, really disrupted how youth organize in Zimbabwe. One of them is migration. A lot of people, young people, leave the country instead of sticking around to actually address some of the issues. Some of them are afraid of violence. People are afraid of that that whole mantra, you uno fira mahara, you will die for nothing. Um, and these are some of the major issues. Um, some of the issues that have, you know, limited youth agency uh, are to do with, uh, you know, issues around, uh, you know, the state in itself uh, uh, using intimidation tactics. Uh, you know, the isolation, being labeled a, a puppet of the West, being labeled you're being used uh, and you're not patriotic and now we are putting up laws that we will arrest you. All of these things have really, really done the most in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, taking away young people from their agency and their organizing. And the final thing uh, that I wanted just to mention is that the system also is becoming very sophisticated to crash agency. They now have counter ways of organizing young people through their, you know, through their uh, socialites, their mbingas, uh, through their musicians that they use. They now have counter platforms where they are organizing and mobilizing young people uh, so that young people are always consistently, uh, you know, distracted, dragged up, and they cannot meaningfully get involved and participate to change their fate. So we need to actually challenge this as young people. And I think that there is room and there is scope. And like I mentioned, we have seen groups of young people that have continued to work amidst the repression and they need more support. They need more resources, more solidarity, more strengthening to ensure that they do not fizzle, they do not move away, but to also identify our allies who are influencers, uh, our allies who are individuals that are musicians, that are socialites, who also agree uh, with all of these things, this, this social good that young people must have uh, that also advance their rights. So I think I'll stop here for now and I might drop off uh, because I was driving. I'd stop just to have this conversation. So if I drop off, please do bear with me. Over. Thank you so much to those valuable contributions we had uh, from our speakers today and, and to you, Namate, for you know, some remarks and, and contributions that were both grounded in reality, but also infused with so much hope and, and so much resilience that I think inspires everyone uh, on this call today. To borrow a quote from my colleague, Mantade, the, the youth are carrying the vision, and I think you're a perfect example of that. So thank you again for your contributions. Right now, um, we're going to turn to our discussant today, Larry Garber, who's been waiting very patiently in the Twitter space uh, before coming to our audience with their questions and contributions. Larry, of course, you have great experience going back many years working on key issues that have impacted Hello. the quality of in Zimbabwe. Um, and we also know, uh, and, and you're an expert on how ZNOPF has tried Hello? to... Hello? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us?
Larry, can you hear us? We can hear you. What happened? Oh, no. I did, waiting and waiting. We can hear you. Okay, so actually, while we wait for Larry to, to figure out his technical difficulties that he might be experiencing, I actually have a question for, for everyone, and maybe just pose this to our speakers um, in the order that they appeared today. I think you're all still with us, Hopewell, uh, Rose, Hello. Renzele, and uh, Namate. Um, I was reading a recent afro Brahm. Jeff, can you hear yes. me? Yes, Larry, can you hear us? Okay, we'll figure that out with Larry and get back to you all with him. Uh, just to, to follow up, I, I just had a quick question for, for all of our speakers thus far, because according to a recent Afrobarometer survey, which I think has been raised here today, some of the, the polling data from that is, is rather bleak. It showed that 65% of Zimbabweans report that the country is moving in the wrong direction. A further 69% said the country's economy is fairly or very bad. And only one out of four think the economy will improve over the next year. You know, as we know, as, as observers of politics, not only in Zimbabwe, but worldwide, in almost every other country that exists in the world, this, this polling data would spell certain, zoom, certain doom uh, for any incumbent party or president. So my question to the panel thus far, uh, before we get to questions from the audience, would be, why, why is this not the case in Zimbabwe? How is this dire polling data even leading us to a, a situation in which the, the president and the incumbent party is perhaps favored to, to maintain power. So I just wanted to open that up to, to the audience, or, or rather to, to our speakers we've had thus far. Perhaps Hopewell, if you're still with us, go to you, and then the order in which the, the speakers um, provided their contributions today. Yep, Hope, I'll go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was being brought to the floor. I didn't realize that I dropped. Um, I, I think I had uh, the gist of your question. Uh, first things first, <clears throat> Zimbabwe was never a democracy. Uh, it's, it's a fallacy to say that Zimbabwe was a democracy. From 1980, intimidation and violence was used all the way right up to today. So it was never a democracy in the true sense of a democracy. Then secondly, um, if you live in a society um, where uh, opposition parties cannot uh, interact and, and function normally, then it becomes difficult to expect an election to be delivered in a free, fair, and credible manner. Then the third aspect is that uh, we belong to a community of nations, and we start with SADC and then the African Union. There's no appetite in SADC to deal with the issues that are facing Zimbabwe. Regardless of the fact that millions of people have crossed the Limpopo to go to South Africa legally and illegally, and that Zimbabwe is no longer a foreign policy issue in South Africa, but a domestic policy issue, because the pressure of, the, of, of, of Zimbabweans coming into South Africa uh, is, is, is making it difficult for the South African economy. So, for instance, 75% of women who give birth at Musina Hospital are from Zimbabwe. We saw that with the uh, health MEC for Limpopo complaining about how her resources are being uh, depleted because of that huge influx of people coming from Zimbabwe and into South Africa to seek health uh, services. But at the top, the heads of state are not bothered about those problems. So these are the same heads of state who are going to come down and uh, adjudicate where there's been a, a dispute in terms of elections. So to expect them to attend to the issue in Zimbabwe when they can't even attend it to, to it when it's, um, it's, it's causing problems for them back home, uh, it's, it's not going to happen. Now, I, I'm not I'm not a prophet, but I can I can say this, and I I, I want you to remember this, uh, Jeff. As we go into 2024, you will see the ANC itself, the ruling party in South Africa, being very xenophobic 
uh, because it is afraid of losing votes. For the first time in the uh, midterm elections, it went uh, 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 below, I think, below 50. Um, and, and that in itself would have uh, made us think that the ANC would realize that the Zimbabwean problems are becoming a, a, a threat to its own grip on power. Its grip on power has been loosened because of the Zimbabwean problems. But no, the Secretary General of the African National Congress, Fikile Mbalula, came out and said, Nelson Chamisa of Zimbabwe, who is the main opposition leader, is an American puppet. He was repeating the same nonsense that has been repeated for years since uh, 2000, when Zimbabwe had a proper opposition to challenge the ZANU PF hegemony, so uh, it's 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 impossible to 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 expect anything else other than what we have known. Uh, the fact that people are being deported, uh, uh, and the fact that Zimbabweans like Dr. Musa Kika, uh, who are being denied accreditation. To, to 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 become election observers in their own country they're being denied they've been told that no you're not going to be election observers in your own country to expect such an election to be remotely credible or fair or, or free it's um, it's, 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 it means that we are not serious so what we are going through now is just emotions jeff um and then we'll see uh, on, on, on the 20th when they announce the um, uh, presidential election result uh, um, that we are going to go through the same pain, uh, the same suffering, emotional suffering, and we'll come back to the same position again. I mean, for ZEC, Zimbabwe Election Commission, to come out and, and, and say... Um, say things that have been parroted by Zanupia for a long time, like, for instance, what happened in Zambia, where the youth defended their vote. Here they've been told that you're not allowed to do so. Um, why, why wouldn't you allow people to stand 300 meters away from a polling station after they've finished to vote? No, they've been told you must go home. Uh, th there are rumors that have been circulating all day today and part of yesterday that the returning officers have been told that they cannot post the presidential vote outside the polling station. Wh why not do that when the law requires you to do so? So that is a systematic uh, process of rigging that we have been talking about for months to say, to start with, uh, observers should be here six months before the election. But some observers are still flying in. What are they going to see, Jeff? They are flying in tomorrow. Uh, the election is the day after they flew into the country. What are they going to see? And after that, they fly off and they write um, uh, reports saying that the election was free and fair simply because perhaps there was no violence in Harare where most of them, or urban areas where most of them go. But they are not going to be in Dotito. Are they going to be in Uzumba? Are they going to be down in the hinterlands in, in Matebele land? You will have observers there belonging to SADAC, belonging to the African East, uh, uh, Union. You'll have uh, observers belonging to institutions, local ones, that have been captured uh, by ZANU-PF, and they will give a clean bill of health to this election. An election that we already know has been rigged because the opposition has not been allowed to, 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 to campaign properly. Over 100 of their rallies have been um, um, denied permission to take place. So it's, 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 it's because of all these terrible things um, that have been happening and that continue to happen, um, why people like myself, lose hope in, in, in anything else other than what we've known. Thank you very much, Hopewell. Uh, we're going to take advantage of the time right now. I think we have Larry back with us, and it seems all to be working on your end. You have the question, so please, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thanks, uh, Jeff, and apologies for the uh, problems with the communications. Uh, first of all, this has been a great panel, and I've enjoyed listening to each of the speakers and uh, I'm all wish everyone who is participating in elections uh, on August 23rd the best of uh, luck in terms of participating and, and, and having a peaceful and successful election. Um, in terms of the question that you asked, Jeff, I mean, and, and, and Hope, Hopewell's comments just uh, lead to it, um, observers 
this case, in, in the Zimbabwe case, have, have had to experience a very difficult uh, environment themselves. And, and, you know, in some ways, you know, you don't like to give credit to uh, a regime for uh, closing the space. In this case, they've been very successful and very smart. And they've learned from their past experiences uh, with international observers uh, in, in terms of how to control them uh, and how to ensure that they get as favorable um, an outcome possible. So just a few examples. Uh, as you mentioned, they they prevented uh, the Carter Center from setting up an operation early on. We had intended, or the Carter Center had intended on observing the elections from back in July 2022 and covering all the aspects of the process, delimitations, voter registration, election law reform, and the like. Uh, and instead, you know, they denied us the ability to physically be in Zimbabwe, but we still carried out uh, observations from from uh, afar, looked at all those issues uh, during pre-election period. Um, they've also had, you know, delays in terms of uh, giving accreditation. They denied accreditation to uh, certain people, including myself, uh, to serve as observers. So they've tried to this process. And, and I should add also the various intimidating uh, statements been made by uh, President Menagagwa and other spokesperson for the regime about, you know, just trying to keep the observers in their place and, and you know, line in a sense. The question comes up of why, you know, why the observers are there, and what, what they hope they can do. And I think there are two explanations uh, that ex uh, serve to uh, rationalize it. One is that very much the opposition, uh, the civil society organizations, have encouraged them to participate as observers and to uh, come. And so, um, you know, under those circumstances, there's sort of a, a pressure to respond to, to the requests that are being made. The second is that the observers, despite all the, the uh, obstacles that the government has put in their place, still have the relying on international standards that that they will apply and relying on um the great work that uh, zimbabwean organizations are doing will also stand to a credible report now i expect as is as true in 2018 there will be different nuances between the observers uh Except what uh, Hopal said, that I'm, I'm much more skeptical about the African Union and SADC, which clearly are the two most important observer groups present. But I think both the Carter Center and the European Union can be on to provide a credible assessment of the process to uh, inform the international community about uh, these elections, taking into account all the aspects of the process, not just what happens on election day, the day after election day, but looking at the environment that existed uh, in which these elections have based on various institutions, whether it's the ZEC or the judiciary, respond to uh, the various concerns and complaints uh, that have been made and that are likely to be made uh, post election to decide uh, to participate uh, and uh, they will have some uh, their participation uh, election or the various parliamentary uh, seats. Thank you so much, Larry. We're so glad you were able to take part in this conversation because you have such valuable insights having worked in Zimbabwe and led observation teams for, for many years in the country and throughout the region. So thank you. We hope you'll be able to stick around for the Q&A session, which we are starting right now. Uh, so I'm going to turn the microphone back over to you, Mentade. I see we have many questions uh, from the audience, so we'll uh, delve into that right now. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, and thank you so much for the panelists' submissions so far. I think they've been great. Um, so like Jeff said, we're now open to participants' audience questions. 
and reflection. So we would ask that you keep your submission to a maximum of one minute so that we have more people contributing to the conversation. So you can ask a general question that any of the panelists can take. We'll allow the panelists to just pick a question from each round of questions that we're going to take, or you can actually ask a specific question to our panelists. So if you have a question, please send a request for the mic. The first round of question will have um, four questions. Remember to keep it short so that we can have more people actually contributing. So um, if you have a question, please send a request. Um, Jeff will be accepting the request and then we'll have you submitting your thoughts. It can be a question, it can be a reflection. So Jeff, I can't actually see the request from here. So if you can just give mic to at least four people and then we take the first round of questions. Great, doing that right now. Cool. Okay, we should have three in the queue, Mentade. Okay. So once I have the people on the mic, I will just pinpoint in terms of the order in which you will do your submissions. Okay, I see two people. Yes. Uh, once we have two more people, okay, we have the third. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the order that we're going to have for your submissions. We're going to have Patavi FM going first. And then afterwards, we'll have Zimbabwe Freedom of Expression. Then we will have Open Zimbabwe. So it's Patavi FM, Zimbabwe Freedom of Expression, and then Open Zimbabwe. You can have the mic, Patavi FM. Uh, thank you so very much. My question will be quite short. I just want to... Uh, ask a quite a bit of a difficult question, which might be an, a bit uncomfortable, but at the same time, I think um, it's necessary that we begin to reflect. My question is, given the sacrifices that Zimbabweans have been making, and Zimbabwe has been experiencing disputed elections since 2002, up to now, uh, the system that we are currently using is Western system, and it must have checks and balances. Leaders must be held to account. The Zimbabwean people have made their sacrifices, but we seem not to be uh, getting enough support so that people's wishes are respected, especially when it comes to elections. My problem now is, uh, given this situation, our Western allies, where are they in all this? Perhaps it might be better to know that we are on our own so that we accept our own fate than to think that we have the will of the international community when in actual fact they are just watching from the sidelines. And at the same time, we are burdened by the sanctions. I, I just want to know where we are with regard to our international partners in this because Zimbabweans have been through a lot and I think even if you have your best friend and you are going through what Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans are going through, I think at some point friends will come and say, you know what, we are on your side, we will fight your battles. But in the Zimbabwean case, it's totally different. Can I ask those on the panel to help me answer this question? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Zimbabwe Freedom of Expression. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for hosting the space. Thank you very much um, to the host and uh, co-host and um, to you, um, Matante, for hosting as well. All the speakers, thank you very much. My first question, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's in regards to the election observers. Um, uh, it has been noted that some have hired vehicles from the likes of Impala Car Hire, which was used by um, the state uh, for abduction and torture purposes. Did the election observers, have the election observers not done their homework in terms of understanding the lie of the land in Zimbabwe and understanding that Zimbabweans have been tortured for decades um, and many of the torturers have been given presidential pardon? especially vis-a-vis -vis the fact that Zimbabwe has not signed up to the treaty against um, summary executions 
uh, torture and um, uh, disappearances? That's the first question. Um, the second question is when it comes to, uh, you know, when election observers are going to be uh, citing the election as free and fair, uh, are they going to be looking at um, uh, previous elections? Uh, or are they only going to be looking at this particular election on its own? Um, uh, because one of your speakers was supposed to be Mr. Nick Cheeseman. And in one, some of his lectures um, that are on YouTube, um, and I've been using them quite a bit uh, to try and highlight the way in which um, election rigging has been happening in the Zimbabwean context vis-a-vis -vis other countries such as Madagascar, Congo, um, uh, those that have been on spaces that we hold, uh, Belarus and, 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 and the like, and even uh, Russia. Uh, he has been highlighting what has been happening in the Zimbabwean context quite a bit. And he said that one of the countries he's going to be focusing on since 2018, um, when he held his lecture, uh, for the next 10 years is, 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 is Zimbabwe. Uh, I was really hoping to have him as one of your panelists because I really wanted to um, uh, go a little bit deeper. I was going to ask him a third question. Those are my two questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Open Zimbabwe Freedom of Ex... I think this was Zimbabwe Freedom of Expression. I don't think I caught your second question. Do you mind um, just summarizing it again? Okay, um, so I didn't fully catch the second question from Zimbabwe Freedom of expression if the panelists caught it i'll be happy um to know that but then if we didn't we'll potentially have him come back to give that question um the last question is coming from open zimbabwe good evening everyone uh thank you so much for the for giving me an opportunity to speak um a few days ago uh a gentleman by the name of chris mutangwa made a statement during uh, uh the chatham house uh, uh press conference where he mentioned that Zimbabwe is a product of war and uh, if, you're, if you want power, you must be willing to take it, meaning that the electoral process in Zimbabwe does not work. Um, if you can go on YouTube, you can actually look it up. He, he literally states that ZANU-PF is the only party that managed to remove two dictators. First, it was Ian Smith, and second, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Right, they claim that they yeah they managed to remove these two dictators, and they said if and he, he mentioned that if you want change, you must be willing to fight for it the same way that they fought for it. Meaning, to them these elections they're just a formality. Now my question to the panel, especially to Hopewell, is if these elections fail, then what? I think that's what Zimbabweans want to know. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Open Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe Freedom of Expression is back. Please repeat your, in, very, in, a, in a short summary, your second Th question. Thank you very much. In a short summary, my second question was, um, election observers, are, you, are they only, or are you only going to be looking at uh, these current elections as if uh, with a fresh pair of eyes, or are you going to consider what happened in the past in previous elections as well? Um, uh, vis a vis, if I can say, matchbox theory. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I think that's all the questions we're taking in this first round. So, for the panelists, you can pick a question that you want to respond to. Just pick one question. Um, I'm not going to assign any. I think there was only one question that was given specifically to Hopo. Um, so, I'll just open it up to the panelists. Take a question that you want to respond to. And then if you feel like you didn't hear part of the question, just let me know. I can just read it again because I wrote it down. Um, so any of the panelists can take any of the questions given so far. I can speak a bit to the question observers and whether they take into account previous elections and whether or not they are, um, you know, how, how different countries are looking at these elections. Um, so the are well aware of Zimbabwe's history uh, with respect to elections. Um, many of the observers have uh, been involved with uh, Zimbabwe previously, 
uh, and that certainly informs, um, you know, their assessment. And, and they are, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, looking to see whether uh, certain of the um, problems that had existed in previous elections have been addressed, um, you know, for these elections, which is why, uh, for example, there was a lot of emphasis placed on the types of electoral reforms uh, that were uh, thought uh, remiss in 2018 and whether or not those reforms uh, would be uh, adopted, the proposed reforms would be adopted by the uh, legislature in time for these elections. And for the most part, I think the conclusion is that it's not been. Um, so that certainly forms part of the context, but at the same time, you know, I think the observers also want to uh, appreciate what is happening now in 2023 uh, and what things have, uh, you know, and how things have either or deteriorated. And as I think the speakers uh, before me uh, mentioned, that they have uh, deteriorated in uh, a number of respects. In terms of you know, countries in the outside of the African continent are looking at these elections, I think you know these elections form part of the uh, diplomatic engagement uh, with Zimbabwe, and certainly uh, the questions regarding uh, the legislation in the United States, uh, which is known as the DERA, uh, the various um, efforts by uh, European. Uh, countries to also push for reforms uh, in Zimbabwe will be very much impacted by their assessment of these elections. Obviously, it's not the only thing that they will take into account in determining uh, where to go in the future, but uh, has been stressed in a number of uh, ways by diplomats uh, from the United States and other countries uh, that these elections are important uh, for uh, you know, future relations with Zimbabwe. I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Thank you so much, um, Larry, for that response. Um, any of the panelists can take the mic. Um, okay. Um, so I will uh, just speak a little bit on the first question, uh, which was asked about uh, the international community. Um, and I think my, res uh, my response to that, no, not I think, my response to that is, um, the world is shifting um, in terms of the geopolitical dynamics. Um, and there has been a very strong human rights versus trade dichotomy that a lot of uh, Western players might not want to actually admit, um, but that is the actual harsh reality. So we have seen the gradual encroachment of the Chinese and the Russian um, into African economics, into wanting to get resources in Africa. And they have been able to do this with African governments because when they come and engage African governments, they do not demand anything related to democracy. They do not demand anything related to human rights. And they say that we will not meddle in your political affairs. Now, Western countries over the years have been very true to their values when they come to Zimbabwe in some instances. And I want to repeat that word, in some instances. Um, of course, we have seen a lot of duplicity, a lot of double standards in their approach. But in the context of the international actors that have been engaging, particularly with the Zimbabwean government, Western countries have in the past put up the idea that for us to be able to trade, to engage, to do business, you first have to adhere to a certain level, a certain benchmark um, of observing human rights standards. Um, of course, you know, the EU talks about, you know, uh, its values, the values of um, uh, freedom, equality, rule of law, justice, and so forth. Um, and the Americans have their own values, which are hinged on democracy, which they seek to export, uh, and so forth. How the West has uh, exported, uh, you know, democracy, human rights, um, um, you know, has been fueled again with a lot of duplicity, has been fueled again with a lot of double standard, but it still cannot, uh, 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 you know, be questioned that they are uh, the only international actor that have put democracy and human rights as a standard upon which uh, they would like to engage African countries. And this was the strong foreign policy international position of most of those countries until recently. And what has happened recently? China, Russia, 
you know, they began to do, uh, 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 you know, a lot of trade deals in Africa. They began to encroach more into African territory, you know, getting minerals, getting trade deals, and the West wanted in on it. And I know that a lot of diplomats might not openly admit it, but this is the case. And we have seen uh, over the years a gradual and incremental uh, unwillingness to be as overt, to be as outspoken about human rights, because most Western governments now want to engage with African governments, including the Zimbabwean government. And the Zimbabwean government is very aware of this. They are very aware that the West now wants to engage. The West wants in on the lithium. They want in on the mineral resources. Um, and henceforth, they have sort of detached themselves to, uh, you know, the you know human rights movement, to activists on the ground. They have detached themselves to, um, you know, a lot of the people that are organizing in very authentic ways ways uh, on the ground because by so affiliating with those groups it makes them very it makes it very difficult for them to engage with the governments of the day so you know i've always argued that when people then say this activist are used by the west i mean at the moment given you know the foreign policy situation and the geopolitical situation the West is actually more interested in engaging with the government. They are not even engaging as much with the opposition itself. They actually are more interested in engaging with the government, which makes that whole rhetoric around being used by the West very washed up. In any case, the people who are being used by foreigners are our very own African governments because they are the ones that are actually engaging all these different players and actors with various interests in our minds, in our land. And some of those people are giving our land away and our, our minerals away uh, uh, you know, at, at very, very uh, low prices. Uh, we're not getting fair market uh, value for those things. A lot of illicit outflows like what Hoppel was saying are happening um, uh, you know, you know, with the government conniving, you know, you know, with some of these East Western players, regardless. So, you know, that question answered in a very uh, simple nutshell is, I think at this point in the history, um, you know, of, uh, you know, our country as Zimbabweans, it is safe for us to say, uh, you know, we must all to look within, we must all to look internally. Of course, we can reach out to the international community and look for opportunities, but we are not a priority. That is the honest and earnest truth. Um, a lot of diplomats will say one thing, but we always watch their behavior. You know, we always watch how they have been quiet around a lot of things that have been happening that they used to speak out about in the past. The PVO bill, the patriotic bill, the arrest. They used to be more active in terms of organizing to denounce that. But now we have seen, you know, it's a bit watered down. So it's a call also uh, to people, um, you know, in Western countries, in Eastern countries around the world who still believe in democracy and human rights to say, you must demand from your governments that when they go to African countries, they cannot do business with just about anybody, with any despot that they find any human rights violator, any person who undermines democracy, because by so doing, they are incentivizing despotic behavior. You must Play, in turn, put laws that also uh, uh, inhibit your companies uh, from trading with certain governments, certain individuals who are well-known human rights violators, who undermine the rule of law. And I know the Germans and the Norwegians have done that to an extent, but I think we ought to see that more being a thing where the citizens of those respective countries also stamp their foot down and say, us as people, we cannot do that. Uh, if we have that particular solidarity, it makes it so much more easier for us to have an international system that is more human rights based than trade based. I think I'll stop here for now. Over. Thank you so much, um, Namatai. Is any of the panelists interested in answering the other questions? Um. I, I I had the questions in bits and pieces because my I don't know whether it's my internet which is playing up, um, but I think the question the, there was a very important question that was asked that if the usual happens on the twentieth of this of of this month, um, what then happens? I think Zimbabweans must learn to um, look at things in the proper picture, uh, prism, right lenses. Uh, in order to get results. Uh, right now, we have a very popular opposition leader, but a very weak opposition party. And Zimbabweans who, who, who want change, some of them don't want to accept this reality. You, you, you can...
Mantadi, it looks like Hopewell is having um, some connectivity issues, so perhaps we can move on. All right. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, is there any other speaker that wants to speak into the questions that were raised? Okay, so I, I think we we can move on to the second and last round of questions. So we already have about three people that have the mic. So I will give the mic first to Bosalani. Bosalani, you ask your question first. Remember to keep it under a minute. And then the question will then go on to Tandi M. After Tandi M, we'll then have Uno Wukanya. And we'll be done with the round of questions. So Bosalani, you can take the mic. Thank you so much, host and uh, co-hosts. Uh, I just wanted to ask, please, uh, uh, a couple of years back, I asked a question to the cons um, conservative MP known as Alex Sharma, and it had to do with Zimbabwe, wh wh whether we could get any kind of assistance from those um, well wishes outside of Zimbabwe. And he answered me and said that the only change that can come to Zimbabwe is when the people are ready for it. And it brings me back to that question to say, are Zimbabweans actually ready for change? Um, I have to look at the political parties that we have at the current moment. I feel that a lot of the problems we're in are because the political party, especially opposition, are not united. You talk about the delimitation report. There was no support when uh, another political party initiated it. It's like whenever anyone initiates something, no one wants to come together and say, let's stand together. I mean, we talk of the voters' role. Anything that happens when it comes to politics, our politicians in the opposition are not united. They forget that. That it's in their best interest for all of them to be united, to stand as one. And I worry that it is because of that that our uh, we're, we're selling ourselves. Then we're going to lose in this coming election. So my question would be to the panelists. What do you believe that the opposition are, are not united? And is that a major problem in what where we are at the current moment? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that. Tandy M. Um, good afternoon, good evening, host and co-host, and good evening to all the listeners. My own is not a question but a submission. I've been listening to most of you um speakers speaking about Zimbabwe speaking about human rights violations, speaking about discrimination, and especially discrimination against, which is very vocal now, the women. I am, when Zimbabwe took power, I was only 17 years old in 1980. And three years later, I went to, um, I was deployed in uh, Lubane or in Cholocha first, to do temporal teaching. So I am a, uh, a fifth brigade survivor. And it hurts me a lot to see people taking advantage of what some of us went through. We know exactly what went on in Zimbabwe, but we didn't have an understanding of why things happened where they did in Cholocho, in Lupane, yeah? and in other parts of Matebele land, Midlands, <coughs> and Manika lands, but mostly in Matebele lands. I was very young when this all happened. And there was a lot of violation of human rights unspeakable. What hurts me most is to hear most of you talk about organization this, organization that, civil movements this. I've spoken out on a lot of platforms to say, you can't lead the dialogue of the people that we had because we are there. We know the truth about what happened. We don't know the truth behind the reason 
of unleashing such horrific or unleashing the 5th Brigade, 6th Brigade, support unit, uh, paratroopers, and all the other uh, militia. We don't know. We are still living in, in, that, in that umbrella of, of not knowing why it happened. But we are trying, especially at my 